We attach ourselves to people that make us feel warm and welcomed. It helps build community and it helps our survival. If you have untreated trauma, it affects you on a DNA level, you can pass that on to your kids. So it's well worth getting your trauma sorted out. And I do my best to see that silver lining within every experience. The solution should be simple, but it's not because we're talking about culture change, talking about changing behaviours, we're talking about challenging identities. G'day everyone, welcome back to the Mind Mate podcast. This is a an audio only show, so if you guys uh, like to watch on YouTube, watch the highlights, uh, sadly there won't be any highlights for this week, but uh, look... I've been getting lots and lots of comments and queries and questions about dreams and dreams are something that I'm extremely, extremely interested in because they taught me a hell of a lot about myself when I was uh, in Bali a couple of years ago. I'd, I'd always looked at my dreams and I'd always found them interesting because they're so bizarre and it feels like uh, there's a there was an author called uh, Matthew Walker and he... Um, he said that a dream is kind of like if you type in on Google, uh, you know, and you get a result that you want, it's like a backwards Google search. It gives you the complete opposite. So it makes complete, no sense whatsoever. But the deeper psychological meaning of dreams in terms of their function for emotional processing, that's kind of the stuff that I wanted to talk about today. And I've, I've written a few blogs about dreams, the function of dreams, um, why interpreting your dreams will set you free, and uh, you know, uh, counseling clients as well. Um, this comes up a lot as well when, when we have a look at dreams and we start and we start to kind of try to understand what the dream is is trying to process in relation to their waking life. And there's so much truth and meaning behind them that uh, I wanted to write a blog and I'm actually going to be reading this blog to you. So you can read it up on Medium as well if you go to Tom Ahern on Medium. But I wanted to uh, uh, read it out because listening is such a great way to get two things done at once. So if you're a long-time listener of the show, I'll often do some of these solo podcasts um, about my blogs and other content, and uh, I really wanted to get this one out there. So this is called This Is Why We Dream, and there's a lot of anecdote in it as well, and I, I hope that it kind of gives you a little bit more of an insight as to not only what the function of the dream is, but also... Uh, how you can interpret your own dreams for greater psychological clarity as well. Uh, guys, as always, if you're interested in any of the content that we focus on at the My Mate podcast, um, just head to my Instagram, tom.ahern. My link tree has all my links. You can buy my books, you can read my blogs, you can check out my podcast on YouTube or uh, wherever you listen to it. And, um, and very, very soon, there'll be a, a, a course relaunch. And the course is, um, has been really good for people, which is really exciting. Um, but uh, this is going to be a, a bit of a relaunch with a bit more practicality to it as well. So anyway, here we go. This is why we dream. Whilst living in Bali, I counseled a Seattle-born expat who later became a friend, keen to unpack some of the issues troubling her. She was moving through the better half of a breakup, but was also keen to decipher some emotionally significant dreams from recent past. Jazz was a bubbly, open-minded yoga fanatic who trained regularly under the coaching guidance of my partner and I. Excuse me. The three of us got along well. Our relationship developed by way of deep and meaningful conversations. Jazz and I met after class one morning. She told me she feared mirrors, fearing not her reflection as such, akin to someone suffering from poor self-esteem, but a supernatural fear, as though something demonic might be staring back at her. This wasn't overly alarming for me. According to pop culture, reflections appear to be the home of anything supernatural, demons and ghosts to name but a few. What's more, I could relate. Throughout adolescence and into my early 20s, anything supernatural, reflections included, was absolutely out of the question. Shortly after her coffee reached drinking temperature, she took a sip and told me about one of her dreams. In her words, I was holding a bird. The bird was broken and bloody and needed attending to. I was the bird, but I was also holding the bird, almost like I was two selves. I just knew the bird was me, although I could pick it up and hold it too, as I was also myself. The bird was so fragile, and it was in a lot of pain. 
There was nothing I could do but hold it and do my best to care for it. Although traumatic experiences are bound by time and place, their emotional weight burdens us for years. We carry the pain and fear like a heavy rucksack. We're triggered by innocuous external cues, anything remotely resembling the past, and shame ourselves for reacting in such ways. We relive the past day after day, an inescapable prison, an internal hell. Jazz knew what the dream meant, sometimes dreams are self-evident. Jazz told me about her past, including childhood trauma, and we came to the conclusion that the bird represented an unreconciled aspect of her psyche. The dream was a wake-up call for Jazz. She'd neglected her own needs for too long. It was time for change. Sometimes we forget about self-care. Exercise, nutrition, meditation, and equally important, cultivating boundaries, assertiveness, and confidence. We look after others, attend to their needs, only to realize it is us who need to be looked after. So we disregard our self-worth. That can come later. We deem it unimportant and irrelevant. We leave it behind, neglected like a dust-ridden child's toy stowed away in an old cupboard. Interpreting and integrating dreams. Up to 80% of PTSD sufferers experience reoccurring nightmares. The sufferer relives the same haunting experiences that triggered the disorder in the first place. Trauma doesn't only arise from war, death, sexual abuse, and physical suffering. We are traumatized all the time, which is to say we encounter overwhelmingly uncomfortable truths that mold our perception of the world and ourselves. The media bombards us with terrible truths from across the world. Starving children, cities bombed, terrorist attacks, and, depending on your definition of trauma, wrongfully elected politicians. <laughs> Similarly, trauma arises when we are faced when we are forced to change our perception of reality. One night in Bali, my partner and I went to dinner with two friends to indulge in a vegetarian buffet. Before long, the conversation moved into the realm of the metaphysical, as usual. We spoke about ghosts, hauntings, demons, spirits, and Mac, a close mate present at the table, told us he could see them. He said, they're not like the movies, rather their energy, like sun rays. This statement triggered my socks off. There was no denying the acute anxiety spike. However, I went with it. Fear stirred inside my belly and turned my armpits into odorous pools. The conversation lasted a further two hours. I was crippled with fear for its entirety. This time, however, I embraced it. Although the fear was present, I continued into the dark forest. What came from the conversation, however, was a very interesting series of dreams. 28th of October, 2018. I'm playing a football game in a concrete jungle, running up and down steps, and I never seem to make it to the other side or score a goal. But flashbacks show me that if I could just score a goal, the crowd would go wild. I can see the crowd and, oh, how I'd wish to bask in that glory of their gratification. I am dating Lady Gaga, who, by the end, wraps me in her legs with this blanket. Then the dream turns sour. The blanket suffocates me and Lady Gaga's motives become sinister. I am now claustrophobic and am locked in, unable to breathe or move. I wake up, although still half asleep, recognizing that the feeling hasn't yet left me. I have a choice. I can sit with this fear or I can try to wake up consciously as quickly as possible. I am in a paralyzed state, like I was as a child. And yet I sit with it. Once that decision has been made, I wake up straight away. Although there was no ghost in this one, the experience of being locked in and, un and unable to move takes me right back to my initial childhood trigger, sleep paralysis. From a young age, all I wanted was to be an Australian rules footballer. I wanted it because I defined and measured success by it. This is not to say that AFL players are not successful, as they most certainly are. For me, in this modern age, however, success is a useless word because it pertains to a destination. In other words, life will only be great when... Dot, dot, dot. The dream above, oh so cunningly, prevented me from basking in that glory, and I think there is an important message there, one that needs no explanation. Furthermore, the dream turned sour and I felt claustrophobic. At the time, I had no idea what it meant, but I later came to realize it was not attempting to reconcile my experiences with ghosts as a child, but rather another traumatic event. 6th of November, 2018, so this is about a week after that dream. This dream showed me what my life may have been like if I'd ended up playing for St. Mary's, a team with which many of my schoolmates played for. As it were, I used to play against them. 
I remember imparting my words of wisdom to a room full of teammates when the coach asked us some sort of philosophical question. This is all in the dream, guys. Uh, so in the dream, I said, beneath every man lies a soul. That was only one way to look at it. I don't normally say things like that, but I've been reading so much fucking Carl Jung lately. Maybe he's rubbing off on me. There were girls in there too. We were in a room that was, in part, where the old Q rooms were. The team I played for and finished up with in 2014, before they renovated. But as we began to train, we ran out onto an oval I don't know. Furthermore, every so often the oval changed to the MCG. It was the grand final too. I was playing really well, yet every now and then... I was just unable to get to the ball and to the opponents running away with the ball in it. So that's a really common thing, guys. When you hear about people's dreams, they talk about running but not being able to get away if they're running away from something or not being able to get to something. It's just a little bit out of their grasp. And, you know, usually without being too cliche, it kind of resembles some inability to let go of an idea or of an expectation or of a goal or of a perception or of some kind of um, circumstance or situation. And, it, it, you know, it depends. And you know, we'll get to this um, as, the, as the blog continues. But when you're analyzing your dreams, it's so important to have a look at every symbol that manifests itself as a representation or as a reflection of who you are. So, you know, what part of you is running away, but is unable to run away? Or what part of you is trying to get somewhere, but is unable to get somewhere? And, you know, that that just adds a little bit of practicality to it. So it doesn't seem so esoteric or so intangible. And, you know, when you start, so I'll often, when I have counseling clients, I'll, I'll often speak to them like that. You know, it's the psychoanalytic tool, but it's a way of being able to see yourself as an organism or as an ecosystem of many different moving parts. So you're not just Tom Ahern and this is who I am. You're, you know, your fear and your happiness and your joy and your, um, you know, uh, motivated and ambitious, but you're also uh, traumatized and frightened, you know, and all these different aspects of yourself arise in the dream and the dream gives it a narrative because if you think about our memories, our memories are, you know, they just, they don't just remember the past. They, 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 they function as a narrative so that we can understand who we were, how we got to where we are. And, and hopefully that helps us orient ourselves for the future. But, you know, if I think of a traumatic dream like this of being, you know, suffocated by, you know, Lady Gaga's legs or whatever it was, you know, what, what part of me feels suffocated, you know, um, that might be pointing to something in the present. Like maybe I don't feel like I have a whole lot of autonomy in my job. Um, you know, maybe I'm, maybe I feel constrained in my relationship because I haven't been telling the truth. Um, but if they're reoccurring dreams, you know, if you feel, if you're being suffocated by different symbols, which happened to me, and I'll get to that, um, maybe that's pointing to a a specific experience that still requires emotional detachment and processing. Um, So I hope that helps, but let's let's continue anyways. Okay, so every now and then I was just unable to get to the ball and two opponents running away with the ball. Cool. We then had to undertake a drill where the coach made us crawl through the devil's snare, vines that are alive and coil around you the more you keep moving and are fearful of them. They come from the world of Harry Potter and are present in the first book. I could feel my panic coming on, but managed to crawl my way out before I became truly anxious. Then, and then I wrote, this keeps coming up in my dreams, this feeling of having something wrapped around my neck and not being able to breathe. What is it? Two dreams pertain to the same idea, playing sport and being unable to breathe. Right. So I've had two similar dreams in the past week. And this is obviously all a true story, guys. This is 2018, three years ago when Siobhan and I were living in Bali. Um, Two dreams in the past week, playing sport and being unable to breathe. Right, so now we're getting somewhere. (coughs) 8th of November, so just two days after that last dream. Here's the dream. I'm playing soccer. I'm playing really well. An old school friend of mine wraps his legs around my shoulders and traps me so that I can't get him off. His legs begin to tighten and after a short while, I'm I'm unable to breathe, but I've already kicked the ball away. How is this fair? Why is no one coming to stop him? What can I do? 
So at the time, I had no idea what was going on. I didn't understand it. You know, I was I was just starting to study dreams and the mind. And then I wrote, be it coiled in vines, wrapped in friends' legs, or wrapped up in a blanket, my unconscious fear manifested itself on the sporting field. By the third dream, I knew what the contents were alluding to. It could only have been one thing. So this is where it started to make sense. And just by interpreting the dreams, not even interpreting, just writing them down, you start to join the dots. <coughs> so I wrote, in 2014, and this actually happened, right? So this is four years prior. In 2014, whilst playing football, an opponent <clears throat> and I got into a fight. He wrapped me up in a choke. I felt intense panic when it occurred, and it was only when a teammate of mine kicked him off that he released his grip. I felt totally powerless because he was behind me, choking me, and I knew no self-defense. I was a football player. Upon this realization, I wrote in my diary, clearly it was traumatizing. Clearly it had been suppressed. Clearly I must sit with it, visualize it, let the fear take over so that my mind will become accustomed to it, recognize it, and allow the associated fear to dissipate naturally. Dreams really do tell us things. So that's an example of why I'm such a massive advocate of uh, dream interpretation, because looking back on that experience, and that really happened, and I, you know, it, <clears throat> at the time I didn't really recognize how traumatic it was for me. I remember having the panic attack, and it's probably why I'm so interested in jujitsu now. You know, I love learning how to defend myself, learning how to um, work, you know, d defense escapes and learning how to choke and, and maneuver my position to choke people as well because it happened to me. And one of the things I really believe is the um, ability to turn our fear and our pain into purpose and, and, and pleasure and something that can help people. And, you know, if I was never choked, <laughs> I keep coughing, guys, excuse me. <coughs> if I was never choked, I would never have fallen in love with jujitsu. So there's a really lovely optimistic spin on that one. But the dream was clearly trying to process a traumatic experience that occurred four years prior. So if you have reoccurring nightmares, guys, I recommend speaking to a counselor. You can speak to me. I love doing this kind of thing, but just getting to the bottom of it because it might really help you understand yourself because it helps you see what you're actually subconsciously reacting to. And the more you know about yourself, the more you can reclaim your own power and have more autonomy over your lives. And that's what we all want, you know, self-growth, the ability to be able to be like, you know what, this is who I am and I fucking love being me. So the blog continues. Fast forward 18 years. I was living in France in the early months of 2019. I was living with my partner, Siobhan, an hour outside Angers amidst the French countryside. One afternoon, Siobhan and I decided upon a well-earned siesta feeding the sheep and horses, cleaning the house, rounding up the lambs and boiling our own beans for lunch proved an exhausting checklist. We slept for an hour or so and I had a dream I'll never forget. I was an old man, well into my 80s. I lay on a hospital bed under the warm covers, smiling up at the people I loved. They were smiling too. No one was crying, nor were they scared. Everything felt right, as did I. I began to close my eyes as I drifted off into eternity. It was indescribable, void of time and place. Because there was no fear, there was also no love, only my awareness. My eyes stayed shut for longer as I drifted further into nothingness, simultaneously boundlessness. Then I experienced an overwhelming sense of fear, an exclusively somatic manifestation, and was pulled back in at an incredible speed into my body lying beneath the warm covers on the hospital bed. Shortly after, I awoke to Siobhan nestled calmly on my chest, still dozing, the sun glaring through the window. I've never had a more real dream. Even upon reflection, I recall no visceral difference between the me lying on the hospital bed and the me lying beneath the French sun embracing my loved one. If anything, the dream taught me that fear separates us from ourselves, others, and the world around us. Fear pulled me back into the human experience, back into individuality and separateness. Fear separated me from eternity, of no time and place, where polarity does not exist. Without fear, we are one. Without fear, judgment and shame die. We judge and shame ourselves and others when we fear we are not enough to ourselves and others. <clears throat> 
So that was a lovely little piece in there. You've got to throw that in, something nice and romantic. <laughs> All right, here we go. So let's, let's dive right in. The function of dreams. The constellations and symbols, the people, colors, emotions, places, and events of the dream represent the many aspects of the dreamer. So that's what I said before. Every symbol that manifests itself in the dream world is some aspect of you. That's a really great way to start this process. Robert A. Johnson, who was a Jungian analyst, noted in his book, Inner Work, which is his book about active imagination and dream interpretation, that, quote, everything in the dream represents an inner state. People in dreams aren't those people, but rather are aspects of ourselves. Within us lie beliefs, attitudes, values, and emotions that conflict with one another. We are not entirely good, nor are we entirely bad. Most of us possess both conservative and progressive political opinions. We have desires that get in the way of each other. There is no black and white when it comes to the human psyche, nor life for that matter. When we dream, we are left to the immense power of the unconscious mind. When our ego defenses are down during sleep, the unconscious attempts to integrate experiences, perspectives, and conflicting belief systems into conscious awareness in an effort to cultivate a more rounded and whole self. So if you think of the dream as a worker that's trying to put all of this stuff that you've come across together into a narrative that makes sense, you'd be on the right path. <laughs> so similar to an artist staring at a black canvas, uncertain as to how her masterpiece will look upon completion, a dream is a visual representation of something significant. A dream is symbolic. A single dream provides no single truth or message, for the dream itself is a blueprint, a framework. It's far too abstract. Rather, the meaning of a dream is found only after the interpretation of a series of similar dreams, right? So that's what we were talking about before. I thought the first dream was all about ghosts, but the more I got into it, it was about getting fucking choked on the football field. <laughs> so you've got to look at the symbols across time. That's why when people are like, oh, I had this dream, what does this mean? I'm like, well, oh, it could mean a whole bunch of things. Sometimes they're really obvious, other times not so obvious because they're abstract. Similar symbols, plots, people, places, etc., arise upon the dreaming landscape. Reoccurring, reoccurring themes are significant. There is something to them, much like the nightmares prevalent among sufferers of PTSD. Right, so that's a perfect example. PTSD sufferers, they dream about the same thing over and over again. So right then and there, already you can't say dreams are arbitrary or trivial because they're a major symptom of a, of a, of a very well-known disorder that's been known for ages and is in the DSM. Laurie Lowenberg, a dream analyst, author, and member of the International Association of the Study of Dreams, <clears throat> noted that nightmares tend to be rooted in difficult, ignored, or mishandled issues. She explains, The best way to respond to a nightmare is to correct the issue that it is connected to. Journaling about your dreams, for instance, may help pinpoint the root of a nightmare, and rewriting your nightmare to include a new ending can be an effective way to train your subconscious to respond differently the next time it occurs. So, <coughs> this is when it... This is when being the creator of your own destiny comes into it. And this is why journaling is so powerful because there is a retraining of the subconscious that is happening when you're doing that. So you're writing down the dream, but if there is a consistent nightmarish symbol, you can rewrite that and go, you know what? Here's what is is here's what I want to happen or this is this is what I would do if that fucking ghost comes at me again. I'm going to I'm this is how I'm going to attack it because you can turn that fear into, into uh, doesn't have to be anger, but into fight or assertiveness, you know? What are the two most primitive responses to, uh, to uh, something that we, to the unknown? It's run and hide or stay and fight. Now, neither are wrong. People always ask, they're like, I don't have to expose myself to the fear. It's like, well, if you have a fear of jumping off a cliff, no, <laughs> but, you do have to do something. And when the emotion gets stuck in the body, that is when we have to do the work 
to get it all out again. That's when breath work and psychedelics and dancing and journaling, that's when all that shit comes into it. But if you express the emotion, if you want to run away in fear, do it. But you have to do something, right? (coughs) So dreams function as a way to forget experiences which no longer apply to an individual's life, a kind of restructuring, remapping process. Dreams appear to act as an intermediary, making distinctions between which memories will help navigate the uncertainty of the future and which ones are to be rendered obsolete. If we remembered everything, all stimuli ever encountered since birth, we would blow up. The brain needs to filter the infinite amount of information it receives from the outside world across time, deciding which of it will be strategically useful for survival purposes. How does the brain know what to remember? Well, Shouldn't it remember only the really important stuff? So clue in here, guys. Shouldn't it focus its attention on when we nearly died, for example, so that that never happens again? Emotionally significant experiences take priority. The brain needs to remember emotionally significant experiences so that if they were to happen again, it will know what to do. It will know how to respond. That is why the definition of a traumatic experience always must include feeling trapped or feeling unable to do anything because that's the same thing that pap- that that people respond to when they have PTSD this feeling of not knowing what to do and that's the scariest thing from a bio- from an evolutionary biological standpoint for the human experience think about getting stuck in a war zone you're trapped nothing you can do can prevent potential bombs going off uh, if you've been sexually abused, you know, and you know, please, if this is a trigger warning for you, um, just take some care, but being sexually abused or, or, or raped, the worst thing that could possibly happen, feeling trapped, not able to do anything when our autonomy, when our power is taken away from us, that is just an absolute cesspool for, for, for trauma to occur. That's why I think, um, there's a great book out there by, is it Maston Kipp? Um, is it reclaim your power? I just think it's a great title for it because it is about power. You know, power gets a bad rep and when it's systematic power, obviously, you know, this isn't a political blog, but your own personal sense of uh, power and autonomy, that's so important, you know, and so many people feel like they don't have that and it is within your reach. Um, and studying your dreams can be one way to not necessarily reclaim your power, but understand when, where, and why it was taken away from you. Okay, so I basically just said what's coming up. This is why people who suffer from post-traumatic stress disorder relive their frightening, nightmarish experiences. They cannot get over the emotionally significant experience. They cannot detach the overwhelming emotion from it. The brain is constantly trying to map the experience, which can be, and often is, incredibly volatile and existentially speaking because it changes your sense of self and the world. So from an existential standpoint, that's really, really major. So an aspect of trauma therapy, therefore, is to help the client detach from the experience. When we are moving through specific and overwhelming emotional experiences, we are changing the way the experience is organized in the brain. We want to get to the point where we feel that the experience no longer is us, rather an event in the past, something that happened to us. Fundamentally, this is why human beings tell stories. We tell stories about ourselves and we tell stories about the world and how the world shaped us and our perceptions so that we can move on from them, right? Psychologists and neuroscientists, Dr. Matthew Walker and Dr. Els van der Helm, sorry, I should have said that, right? Dr. Els van der Helm have proposed that the brain goes through a kind of overnight emotional therapy during REM sleep, whereby emotions from particularly overwhelming experiences are detached from the experiences themselves, solidifying long-term memories that provide individuals with a sense of identity. As we sleep, we continue to write and rewrite the stories of our lives, placing and removing significances upon events that have shaped our lives, those that have shifted our identity and worldview. The brain is oriented towards the future. It interprets the present and makes assumptions and associations based upon emotionally significant past experiences. It then feeds all that information into an internal processing machine, ascertaining what it believes to be educated, accurate, predictable outcomes. 
Okay, so this is back to an anecdote now, guys, and this is a perfect example, uh, at least in my humble opinion, of what the brain does um, through the dream, okay? So now that we have all that context, okay, so it's trying to process emotionally charged events, um, the purpose of a memory isn't to remember the past objectively, but to write a narrative for our lives so that we make sense, um, so this, hopefully this will make sense to you. As a child, I often dreamt about 9-11. That day really did change the world and not for the better. My only true memory of it, I was eight, and I think my other memories are tangled in the recollections of others, was of mum watching the TV in horror as the news reported the events. She was wearing a red woolen top. Her hand covered her mouth. She was in shock. She was lost for words, as was everyone that day. In her own words, I had to keep watching the replays just to be sure I was actually watching the news, not some show. How could planes fly into buildings? Why were people burning? Why were they jumping to their deaths? None of it made any sense. I couldn't make sense of it. I'm assuming my dad was still at work and my sister still at school because I ate dinner alone that night. I sat at the kitchen bench watching mum. Mum stood behind the bench watching the news. She wasn't moving and I was scared. Not because I feared the threat of terrorism in Australia. That fear was for adults. I was scared because mum was scared. I didn't understand what terrorism, extremism, hijack or bin Laden meant. I only knew I'd never seen mum like that before and I didn't like it. Many nights directly after 9-11, I'd wake up in a fright and run into my parents' room. The reoccurring theme of these nightmares were as follows. I was in the middle of the city, Melbourne, not New York. As planes flew into buildings and strangers ran around with bombs blowing things up, murdering thousands. Right, so as a child, I don't know what a New York is. I've never seen New York. I don't understand it. All I know buildings is, is buildings. So in terms of my own subjective experience, my brain goes, ah, buildings. Okay, this is bad. So how does this, uh, how does this work in with our own... Uh, perception of the world. Well, Melbourne has buildings. You live in Melbourne. This could happen to you if it happened in Melbourne. So it brings it all back into Melbourne. Into Melbourne. So planes are flying into building in buildings in Melbourne. My 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 dad, which I talk about in a second. You know, my dad uh, dies um, by by getting blown up in a building because he's not at home that night. Only mum's at home. So my brain is trying to map this shit really quickly to know what to do if this would ever happen to me. So I hope that makes sense. I've not forgotten them to this day, these dreams. Interestingly enough, planes and bombs never frightened me. What did, however, was that I was alone. Mum wasn't there to protect me. In one of the dreams, my dad died. He was in a building struck by a hijacked plane. To this day, I can picture dad falling from a high building floor. I now recognize that both 9-11 and my frightened mum were extremely significant external cues. My mind had its work cut out. It hadn't ever experienced vulnerability like that before. It had some serious integration work to do. What if mum was too frightened to protect me? What if something like 9-11 happened in Melbourne? My mind needed a plan. So that's what the dream was doing. It was functioning to provide a plan. My fear and resistance surrounding these cues most likely led to the nightmares my mind's stubborn push for integration, an attack on my lowered ego defenses. After some time, I got the message. The nightmares worked because I stopped having them. Right, so this is the way I wanted to finish this podcast team. Uh, and you can you can have a look at the notes, the references of the books that I read um, for that blog um, on my Medium page. At the very end I wrote, the, night, the nightmares worked because I stopped having them. Time and time again, you hear about people talking about, oh, I have this nightmare and I, you know, can you just give me some Valium or something to, you know, to, to, to make it go away. And that's the worst thing you can do. And I understand that that's a difficult thing to hear because nightmares are terrifying, you know, just like going back into our pain and our trauma, whether it's psychedelics, EMDR, a counseling session with talk therapy, um, anything, it's difficult. But in terms of healing and getting better, the integration process is the only thing that's going to make you feel uh, whole again. 
And I've done all sorts of things with this. You know, um, I did a podcast about my MDMA experience where I was just seeing so many different parts of myself that were healing old traumas. You know, my fears about hell and seeing that black cloud hugged by this ball of love. Um, you know, I've had shit like that in dreams where someone who terrified me as a child, I grew into a 20 foot giant and I was bashing her into the ground and, you know, and it's, it's a sim- it's symbolic. It's what the subconscious is doing to try to process this stuff. But my hope that my hope for you after having listened to this podcast is that you look upon your dreams with a little bit more interest and curiosity because they can show you so much more about who you are as opposed to who you think you are from a superficial standpoint. I know that sounds um, condescending and I'm, you know, I'm, I'm not meaning it to be. I'm kind of saying that to me too, but we can get lost in the superficiality of life so easily because you know, now we can't ever get bored. But, and, and, and I think that's why lots of people are looking into psychedelics, myself included, because they provide an access point to the, the deeper, meaningful truths. But my point is save your fucking money and get a good night's sleep and keep a journal by your bed because every night, you know, you get three to four sleep cycles of psychedelic assisted therapy (laughs) because what comes up in psychedelics experiences with the visions and all that kind of stuff. And I might cop a bit of slack for this because people, you know, are so psychedelics or everything. And I, I, I'm in that. I mean, I think they're great too, obviously, but you can get, you can get that from the dream. You know, what happens in a dream is very similar to kind of what happens in a, in a psychedelic um, experience, depending on, on the dose and the set and the setting and all that. And it can be terrifying to take an exogenous substance because you really don't feel like you have any control, but you wake up from a dream and you're back into being who you are. And if you can start to get in the habit of um, writing your dreams down, you can follow the integration process. That's the coolest thing about them. Um, so yeah, guys, I hope that was a, uh, uh, a valuable show for you. Um, reach out to me. I, I, I love, I love talking to you guys. It's so, it's so awesome. And I just, this is the coolest thing ever. Having, um, having a podcast to talk about this kind of stuff. It's, you know, spirituality, psychedelics, philosophy, culture, um, dreams, you know, self-development. It's, it's really, really cool. And I love the community that we're building here. Um, you guys are, yeah, it's so fun to, to talk to you, whether it's in, um, on Instagram or through Facebook. Um, I love that. And, um, just, just keep doing it and, and reach out to me because I want to actually set up a MindMates Facebook group where we can all talk about this stuff together and we can analyze dreams together and, um, and really go for it with, with all that kind of thing. So I was also even thinking about getting some of you guys on the show and we can talk together to kind of build this up as a, as a real community, like it could be, but Guys, that was uh, the podcast, This Is Why We Dream. And if you like what we're doing here, and by we, I mean me and my virtual assistant, Alvin, who is a legend. Shout out, Alvin. I love you, brother. Um, Could you give us a rating and review on iTunes? That actually, it genuinely helps. It actually really helps boost it. And uh, if you do that, I love you very much. If you don't do it, I still love you because you listened to to the full show and uh you know you might have you might have listened to other shows as well but uh yeah lots of love (laughs) all right guys i'll speak to you next week